not eliminating God. They're eliminating models of God. You learn Sanskrit. Go back to your scriptures. Go back to your Vedas and realize that God is one. Division in Islam is prohibited. We understand the concept of God in Hinduism. Quran is the most positive book. Every day, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted in India after they identified that they're females. According to the statutes of 1996, U.S. Department of Justice, 2,730 women are being raped every day. Every 32 seconds, one woman is being raped. I've been raped in U.S. until the time I'm here. Islam has the solutions to the problems of the West. Of the West. There is none greater than the Creator, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. There is none greater than the Creator, Allahu Akbar.
جزاك الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من ألق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالكلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم رب شعلي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفقه كولي My special elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. It's a pleasure for me to be once again back to London, especially Harrow, after a span of eight months. The topic of this evening's talk is seeking knowledge in the light of Islam. Your children are an amana. Give them the best education for both the worlds. It is a long topic, but it's basically dealing with seeking knowledge in the light of Islam and that your children are an amana, so give them the best education for both the worlds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the glorious Quran, the first guidance that he gave to the whole of humankind, it was not to pray, it was not to fast, it was not to perform hajj, but the first guidance given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran to the whole of humankind was Ikra. 
It was to read. It was to recite. It was to proclaim. And I start my talk by quoting a few verses from the Quran, from Surah Iqra, chapter number 96, verse number 1 to 5, where Allah says, Iqra, bismi rabbika allazi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, ikra wa rabbuka al-akram, allazi alama bil kalam, allam al-insana ma alam yalam, which means read, recite, and proclaim in the name of thy Lord who has created, who has created the human beings from something which clings, a leech-like substance. Read, the Lord is most bountiful. He who has taught the use of pen has taught men that which he knew not. Though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the first guidance in the glorious Quran that we should read, but unfortunately, we realize that the Muslims, in the Muslim community, everyone does not read. And those Muslims who are involved in acquiring knowledge, in reading, they don't read as per the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah does not say only read. Allah says, Iqra bismi rabbi khalaq. Read in the name of thy Lord. So when we read, when we acquire knowledge, we should acquire knowledge in such a way that we come closer to our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the knowledge does not bring you closer towards your creator, towards your Rabb, then that knowledge is not useful for the Akhirah. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's a Sahih Hadith, which mentioned Ibn Majah, Hadith number 224, our beloved Prophet said, Talibul ilmi, seeking knowledge, Faridatun ala kulli Muslim, is obligatory on every Muslim. Seeking knowledge, is obligatory on every Muslim, man or woman. It's compulsory that every Muslim should acquire knowledge. And it is the duty of us Muslims to see to it that we acquire knowledge. Many of us, we think that knowledge is only what we study in schools, in colleges, and universities. Education and knowledge starts at home. And the best teacher is the mother. It is the duty of the parents to see to it that they properly educate the children. See to it that they give them proper education. Because the child, when he or she is born, they are not responsible for the environment in which they are born. It is the duty of the parents to see to it that irrespective of the environment, they give them proper education. And today we find that there are various societies and the various ways of life in these societies. We have the Islamic way of life, we have the Western way of life, and we have a variety of different ways of life. As far as Islam is concerned, Islam is a complete way of life. It caters both to the spiritual aspect of the soul, as well as the physical aspect of the body. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number three, on this day have I completed your religion for you, and have completed my favor for you, and have chosen for you Islam. So once Islam is completed, nothing new can be added or subtracted from it. Our deen is complete. So. As far as the way of life is concerned, Islam is a complete way of life. When we mix Islam with the other societies and other ways of life and other cultures, whichever culture we are living in, if that part of the culture is not against the Islamic Sharia, is not against the Quran and the Sai Hadith, we do not mind following or agreeing with that culture. But if that culture, if that society goes against Quran and Sai Hadith, we should not follow it. Islam is number one. And now we find that many a times while upbringing our children, we have a problem because of the differences in societies and cultures. And we are aware of the Western society, as many of the Muslims, they're living in Western society. And we find that 
Though the Western society it is advanced in science and technology, but as far as moral values are concerned, they are declining. We find in the Western society that alcoholism is on the increase, drug addiction is on the increase, obscenity is on the increase, adultery is on the increase, rape is on the increase, crime is on the increase. While educating our children, we should see to it that we give them a proper Islamic education. And while we train them and upbring them in a Western society or any society in the world, it may be an Eastern society also, we should see to it that we should make them a good Muslim. That is, one who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Islam means peace acquired by submitting a will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And any person who acquires peace by submitting his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is called as a Muslim. While educating our children, we should see to it that we should not get so much impressed by the Western society. We should only take the correct values from the society. We don't want our children to become alcoholics, to become drug addicts, to become adulterers, to become rapists. We want them to be good Muslims who submit the will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that every child, he is born in Dinul Fitr. Dinul Fitr means the innate religion. Every child is born as a Muslim. He submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, the elders, the parents, the teachers, they influence the child. He may remain on the straight path or he may become a fire worshipper, he may become an idol worshipper, and then he may go outside the fold of Islam. But every child initially, irrespective whether he's born in a Hindu family, whether he's born in a Christian family, a Jewish family, or a Muslim family, he is born as a Muslim. He submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, by the influence of other people, parents, teachers, elders, he may go on the wrong track. That's the reason. Whenever any non-Muslim, he accepts Islam, the more appropriate and correct word is revert. He was on the straight path, he went on the wrong track, and then he came back on the straight path, on the straight track. So the correct word is revert. And we have got proof and evidence that every child he is born in Dinul Fitr. There were researches done on two tribes, the Kapauku tribe and the Australian Aborigine tribe. These two tribes did not come in contact with modern civilization till as late as 1950. And later on when researchers went and tried to find out what was the way of life. It was everything of Islam but in name. They did not call themselves Muslims, but they believed in one God. They believed that God did not have any idols or images. They believed he was not begotten. When they worshipped the God, they did the sujood. They prostrated. They were following the basics of Islam, but they didn't call themselves Muslims. So if we let a child after he's born, if we do not influence him, with any of the teachings, that child will grow up to be a Muslim. That is the dinul fitr, innate religion. It is the duty of the parents that once the child is born, they should see to it that they give that child a proper environment to live and to continue life. It is the duty of the parents that they should see to it that they give proper education to the children. And many of us we are worried about the education of our children. I would like to ask a question that when is the time you should start thinking about educating your child? What is the right time? Can anyone give the answer that which is the right time? When do you start thinking what you want to make your child or what you want to make him? What should he be in life? Which is the right time? Which is the right time? Right from the beginning. 
as soon as he understands. Sorry? When he starts to think to get a child, he may start thinking after 10 years. Which is the right time? Seven years old. Seven years old, two years old, when he can understand, when he's born. One year old. One year old. Fine, here we have different options. Here someone is saying three years old, three years old. Someone is saying three years old, someone is saying two years old, someone is saying one year old, someone is saying when he's born. Islamically, the time to think of educating a child, the latest you should think, latest, huh? maximum, is when you choose your life partner. When you choose your life partner is the time you have to think about educating a child because the parents are the best teachers, especially the mother. That is the time if you want to make your child Islamic, you should see to it that you have a spouse who is Islamic. If you don't have Islamic spouse, how would you expect your child to be Islamic? So depending upon how you want to upbring your child is the time you start thinking when you choose a life partner. That does not mean already those who are married should choose a new life partner. <laughs> Some people ask me, now I'm already married, what should I do? It is better late than never. You can start molding your life partner into that style. No problem, you can do dawa with the life partner. So you should realize that the best time to start thinking about educating your child, the latest is when you choose a life partner. As I was saying, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's a Sahih Hadith, which is mentioned in Ibn Majah, Hadith number 224, our beloved Prophet said, Talibul ilmi, seeking knowledge, Faridatun ala kulli Muslim, is obligatory on every Muslim. Seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim, man or woman. Now when we give knowledge to our children, we have to see to it that we give them proper knowledge. Knowledge can be broadly divided into two types. One is the basic knowledge of Islam. And second, knowledge what is required by the community. It is the duty of every parent that he should educate the children with the proper Islamic knowledge. Number one, most important is Tawheed. That believing in one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should not associate partners with anyone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not be associated with anyone else. Tawheed, number one. Then all the pillars which most of us know, but we should impart it in the right way to our children. About salah, about zakat, about hajj, about fasting. It's very important. And, but natural, knowledge of the Quran. This Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yesterday in Bradford, I had a talk on Al-Quran, should it be read with understanding? And I told there that the best gift that a parent can give to the child is the Quran, and make the child understand the Quran. Most of us Muslims, we teach our children to read Arabic, they can read Arabic, but they can't understand. If we teach them the language of the Quran, the Arabic as a language, that is the best gift you can give. And inshallah, towards the end of my talk, I will deal and discuss with that in detail. The second type of knowledge is the knowledge required by the community. Knowledge which makes a person a doctor, makes a person an engineer, a lawyer, a scientist, an agriculturist. This is too required for the betterment of the community, for the betterment of the society. But when we are acquiring the second type of knowledge, we should see to it that when we acquire scientific knowledge, when we learn about mathematics, geography, history, this knowledge should get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, should not take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If this knowledge takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that knowledge is not correct knowledge. It's not correct education. It should bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, when we learn medicine, we learn how to save the lives of thousands of human beings. But in that same medical knowledge, when we learn how to do abortion, 
that are youngsters who are doing zina, and then they want to abort. So using this knowledge for activities which are wrong, we should abstain from that. Abortion for saving the life of the mother. If she has a health problem, Islam gives permission. Otherwise, Allah says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 31, and Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 151, that kill not your children for want of sustenance. Killing of children is prohibited. So whatever knowledge you acquire, it should be for the betterment of humanity and get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever moral values you are learning, we should see to it that when we put our children in the school, that school should upbring our children properly. Imagine if we put our children in the convent school, many of whose values don't match with the value of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is like we are tying the hands and legs of our children and putting them in water and asking them to swim. How will they swim? So when we put them in a school, see to it you put them in a proper school. If the culture and society and the school teaches you manners, it should be good Islamic manners. Nowadays we find that in the Western culture, they say that manners is building old age homes. Islam has got no place for old age homes. Because Islam believes that we should love and respect our parents. And there are several verses in the Quran. Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 15. Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 8. Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 151. Several verses we say that we have enjoined on the human beings that to be kind and good to your parents. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, verse number 8, in the book of Adab, chapter number 2, hadith number 2, there's a person who approached the Prophet and he asked him that who deserves the maximum love and companionship in the world? So the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that who? The Prophet again repeated your mother. The man asked after that who? Again the Prophet said for the third time your mother. The man asked after that who? Then the Prophet said your father. 75%, three-fourths of the love and companionship goes to the mother. 25%, one-fourth goes to the father. In short, mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. <laughs> so Islam teaches that we have to love our parents, and especially as far as companionship is concerned, the mother gets three times more. So in Islam, there is no place for old age homes. So whatever manners and etiquettes that we teach our children, it should be in line with what our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. And we find today that Muslims are in the firing line. We find that Muslims have become backward as far as science technology is concerned, as far as education is concerned. And the main reason is because we have gone away from the Quran and Sunnah. Previously, from the 8th to the 12th century, it was called as the Dark Ages. Dark for whom? Dark for the Europeans. The amount of advances the Muslim Arabs made, it is phenomenal. And if we read history, what we read in school, I myself have passed from a convent school, a Christian missionary school, I've got my education from there. It's later on, Afterwards, I realized that what I read in school and in my medical college, I being a medical doctor, many things is something different. We are taught in school that the blood circulation was first discovered by William Harvey. In fact, if you read the Quran, Quran speaks about the blood circulation. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 66, how does the food enter into the stomach? Then from there, it goes into the intestine. From the intestine, why the blood stream to various organs of the body, including the mammary gland, which is responsible for the production of milk. It speaks about the production of milk and about the blood circulation in a nutshell in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 66. After I did research, I came to know that the first human being who first described the blood circulation was Ibn Nafis, 600 years after the Quran was revealed and 400 years before William Harvey. But when we read in our textbook, 
We are told about William Harvey. How many of us know about Ibn Nafis? How many of us? Hardly anyone knows that Ibn Nafis was the first person who described the blood circulation. We learn about geography, but the person who drew the first world map of geography was Ali Drusi in 1154. What we study, the digits in school, you know what's it's called? It is called as Arabic numerals. The one, two, three, four that we use for writing. One, two, three, four. It is called as Arabic numerals. The other is a Roman numeral. The Indians were the people who first discovered about the zero, and the Arabs took it from there and made it famous to the world by adding a decimal. That's how we have the system today. We learn in mathematics about the Pythagoras theorem that the square of the hypotenuse in a triangle is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides. The Pythagoras theorem that we learn in school, it was first discovered by Al-Uqtusi. So we know that Muslims, few centuries back, they were advanced in science and technology. But when we read in our textbook today, they are hardly mentioned. Who is the father of trigonometry? It is Al-Biruni. Have you heard of Al-Khindi? Al-Khindi wrote 200 works in mathematics, in geometry, in logic. And at a time when Galileo, Descartes, and Newton, when they said that all physical laws are absolute, he said that it was relative. Later on, Albert Einstein did more research, and he propounded the theory of relativity. When we read history, we come to know that Muhammad, Ahmad, and Hassan Shakir, these brothers, they measured the surface area of the Earth by measuring the angle at the Red Sea at a time when people thought the world was flat. We learn chemistry, and we are told that Geber is the person who discovered alcohol. It is Jabir ibn Hayyan, Jabir. When they write in our textbook, it's Geber, Geber, sounds like a Westerner, Geber. It is Jabir ibn Hayyan. When we read, we think oh, it's a Westerner, Geber, Geber. And Jabir ibn Hayyan, he discovered alcohol, and the word alcohol comes from the Arabic word al-gul, meaning evil spirit. When we history, we come to know about Muhammad Zakaria Arazi. He was advanced in the field of medicine, and he even wrote books on measles and smallpox. When we read medicine, we know that Ali ibn Abbas, he wrote 20 volumes on practice and theory of medicine. We are told about Avicenna, Avicenna, the Aristotle of the East. It is Ali ibn Sina. Ali ibn Sina, he was called as the Aristotle of the East. He was a philosopher, he was a mathematician. So when we go back to history and we see that we Muslims, we were on top of the world. The reason we were on top of the world at that time is because at that time, we were close to the Quran and Sunnah. Now, we have gone away from Quran and Sunnah, and that's the reason we are in the firing line. We should see to it that we upbring our children close to the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. It is a duty that we give our children proper education. That's the reason, I say, that your children are your amana. See to it, you give them proper education for both the worlds. And this was a dilemma that I faced maybe eight years back. And though, alhamdulillah, I used to give talks on education. And I did take time to choose my life partner because I wanted the right life partner. And finally, Allah gave me, alhamdulillah. And when the children were born, my eldest son is 12 years old. And I always had that thing that we should have a proper school which has a striking balance between the Islamic education and the formal education. I don't call mathematics science as secular education because secular by definition means nothing to do with God. I believe science believes in God. Mathematics is the Islamic subject. So therefore, when I talk about the other conventional subjects, I call them formal education. Mathematics, science, history, geography, English. We call it as formal subjects. So I always had that dream that to have a school which has the striking balance between 
the Islamic subjects, Islamic education, and the formal education. Because mathematics, science, history, according to me, are part of Islam. And that made me tour the world. And I did a survey, alhamdulillah, of most of the Islamic schools at that time. That was about six to eight years back. In a span of two, three years, mashallah, I went to most of the best schools of the world, in America, in Canada, in UK, in South Africa, in Australia, in Malaysia, and I visited hundreds of schools. And when I observed that in the Western countries, most of the Islamic schools, almost all, they were more of a Muslim managed school. Muslim managed school means the management was Muslim, but I would not call them as Islamic schools. Because we realize that in the Western world, there is a fear of alcoholism, of drug addiction, of obscenity. So in these schools, we found that the dress code that the students wore, they were Islamic hijab, mashallah. They had a time for prayer, for salah, alhamdulillah. There was no alcohol, there was no drug, alhamdulillah. So that was what was called the Islamic school. Where back in India, most of the Muslim many schools, they have the Islamic dress code, you can offer salah, there's no alcohol, there's no drug. So I did not find something new. But alhamdulillah, considering the Western country, where drug addiction is common, alcoholism is common, obscenity is common, it is an achievement which I was happy. But what I came to search for, that when our children go to school, they should get the best of knowledge, I could not find any of the schools. We have now the Muslim Ummah rather divided into two types of education. One type of education, when we have secular education, they acquire the so-called secular education, which are called a formal education. They acquire knowledge of mathematics, science, history, geography, but they are far away from the deen. On the other hand, when we go to our madrasas, we teach about Quran, Hadith, Sharia, Fiqh. Alhamdulillah, may Allah give them reward. But they are unaware of mathematics, science, history, geography. So we wanted a balance between the two, to have the best of both, which when we visited most of the schools that I visited, now the thing is changing. In the past six years, I've realized that some schools have become slightly closer, alhamdulillah, to the concept that I have. But most of the schools, they may be having maybe three periods a week on Islam, or maybe one period a day. Maximum I came across was two periods a day on Islam. And what was the main objective that a child, when he passes from school, he should have the knowledge of Quran, Hadith, Sharia, Fiqh, and science, etc. That I could not find. Though I visited the best of schools in America, in South Africa, which is supposed to be very much advanced in this field of Islamic schools, UK, Australia, Malaysia, etc. So that we thought that, let's make an effort. And with Allah's help, Alhamdulillah, we in Bombay, Alhamdulillah, about approximately six years back, or rather five and a half years back, we launched our own Islamic school by the name of Islamic International School. Because for my children, we had to do it. Though I was prepared to see to it that gear up my child, though putting in a convent school by giving all the so-called education at home, but then we thought that we should make a sample school. And alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, we ventured with this project in Bombay, and Allah helped us, and with Allah's support, we launched the school. And alhamdulillah, from day one, the response that we received from the people of Bombay, from the Muslims of Bombay, was tremendous, mashallah. The response was such that though the school was absolutely new, we hardly publicized it. We decided to start the school. There was only three weeks' publicity, mashallah. But immediately when the school was launched, the amount of response we got was phenomenal. And it was overwhelming that ministers, they phoned our school to see to it that some of the friends get admission to the school. It was good, mashallah. You will hardly find a minister phoning a madrasa and telling that, you know, I want a seat in your madrasa. We find that in the convent school. In India, most of the convent school, the ministers phone, and they try and use the influence. But alhamdulillah, we are very strict as far as admission criteria is concerned. We are very strict. 
with the guidelines. And unless a person fulfills our guidelines, let him be a minister, son also, we won't give admission, alhamdulillah. The difference that is there, that we appreciated that the movement that was started by many of the philanthropists and educationists throughout the world, it was a good movement, at least giving them an environment of Islam. So I was really happy that in the Western countries, whether it had been USA, UK, there were schools in which a child could at least practice his Islam. When the school that we launched, we had a different system we had, that I wanted a striking balance that when a child passes the 10th standard, he should become at least an average alim when he passes from Darul Ulum, as well as be able to compete with the best of convent schools in that city. That was the aim. And with that target, we started the school. And we did many unconventional things, which people told it's not possible. But Alhamdulillah, with Allah's help, we did it. The timing of a school is quite long. It starts from 8 o'clock to 4.30. For nursery, it is less. We started school from nursery, from the age of three. And the first year, we had nursery, junior kg, senior kg, and first standard, only four classes, only four grades. And the timing from first onwards, first upwards, is from 8 o'clock to 4.30. And people said the timing is too long. Students won't be able to take it. But alhamdulillah, we divide the day into 12 periods, each of 35 minutes. On an average, two periods every day are for extracurricular activities. Martial arts, whether it be taekwondo, judo, swimming, whether it be computers, and all the extracurricular activities on an average two periods a day. Every child, it's compulsory, should learn swimming, taekwondo, judo, martial arts, for the boys, football, etc. And the balanced 10 periods, five periods are in English and five in Arabic. Our school has a dual minimum instruction, English and Arabic. Arabic is the language of the Quran. It's the language in which the last and final revelation was revealed. We realize, I realize the drawback, that because our parents did not think it important that we should learn Arabic as a language, we know it's a drawback, even today. So we want to see to it that our children, our next generation, they should know Arabic as the mother tongue. So five periods are in Arabic, five are in English. But naturally, the five periods that are then Arabic, they're Islamic, whether it be Arabic language, whether it be Hivs, whether it be Talawat, whether it be Hadith, whether it be Quran, Tafsir, and all the Islamic studies that we have, when we give the Tafsir of the Quran, it's not in English or Urdu. Like back home in India, Pakistan, we have the Islamic studies in Urdu. In the Western countries, we either have in Urdu or we have in English. There, we have in Arabic, Arabic to Arabic. So the child, from the age of three, when he joins nursery school, he starts learning Arabic. When we teach him A for Allah, B for Bismillah, along with that, Min Alif Asadun, Min Ma Baitun, Min Ta Tufahun. So from the age of three, the child is ingrained with the Arabic language. And in the Arabic period, the children cannot speak English, they should only speak Arabic. In the English period, only English, no Arabic. And most of Arabic teachers, they have gone to Saudi Arabia and they have graduated from the Islamic University of Medina so that even the pronunciation is correct. Besides the Arabic period that is there, the five periods in English, one period every day is Islamic studies in English. That's for Dawah. Well, the child, when he does Dawah with the non-Muslim, it will be in English, he can't do in Arabic. There are very few Arab non-Muslims. So one period is Islamic studies in English. The balance four periods on average is maths, English, geography, history, science, etc. And though the period, if you analyze that five periods in English, is very less. But we have been able to achieve this because the ratio of our teacher to student is very low. In Bombay, on an average, on an average, in Bombay, one school, each class has 50 students. Some have got 60, some have got 70, some have got 80. The good schools have got 50, very few schools have less than 50. And for every two classes, there are average three teachers. That means each teacher, the ratio of teacher and student is about 30 to 35. 
Every 30 to 35 students have got one teacher in Bombay and in India. If you go in the villages, it is much higher. Every one teacher has got 50 students on average. And the international standard says that it should be 1 to 20. The good private schools in UK, USA, they have every teacher has got 10 students on average. The good private schools. We in Bombay, we have every five students one teacher. Each class has got 20 students on average. Some have got 18, some have got 19. But at times, for example, when there are classes of his, so in that class of 20 students, there will be five kurras coming in, karis. So each batch will have about four students. So when we have certain classes, it breaks up so that the hips is better. The concentration is better, so the child can learn faster. In our school, hips is compulsory to standard three. To standard three, the child in nursery junior kg, he starts the Asana Quran. He does the Nazar of the Quran in senior kg, starts doing hips in senior kg. On average, senior kg, he memorizes half juz. First, second, and third, every year one and a half juz. So by the time the child completes standard three, he memorizes at least five juz. Some may memorize six, some seven, some may even do four. After that, hips is optional. Those people who feel have got a good memory, we select them maybe 25%, one fourth to one third of the students, and we call them one hour 15 minutes earlier. So instead of coming at 8 o'clock in the morning, from 4th standard, they come at cow to 7. Now, when the HIFS class in the morning is conducted after 3rd standard, for one Kari, there are two students maximum. So the ratio of the Kari and the students in the higher classes is reduced. One Kari, one student, or one Kari, two students maximum. And only because he comes 1 hour 15 minutes early in the morning, does HIFS for 1 hour 10 minutes, in a year, on an average, that child memorizes five Jews. So by the time he completes the next five years, at the end of eight standard, he memorizes the complete Quran. <laughs> so, so far, mashallah, we are in the sixth standard. In the fifth standard, according to our normal course, the child should memorize 15 Jews. But many students, mashallah, at the end of fifth standard, have memorized 18 Jews, some 19, some even 20. So my son, who's now in the sixth, He's hardly 12 years old, mashallah. He knows more Quran than me. He knows 20 Jews. I don't know that much. I'm not Hafizul Quran. His Qurat is better than mine. He can understand Arabic better than me. He can understand the Quran directly. I can't. So we want every child in our school to be better than what I was when I was in school. And inshallah, minimum, minimum, every child in our school, minimum, is 100 times better than what I was when I was a child. We want every child in the school should be multiple times like me. I am not the target. I am not the aim. I am not the sample. We want them to be multiple times better. So what we could not get in our childhood. And with Allah's help, Alhamdulillah, whatever we achieved, we feel that if we educate our children in the right way, right from the childhood, inshallah, inshallah, you will find a change in the next generation. There is no greater than the Creator, Allahu Akbar.